Good afternoon, good morning, and welcome to the Catalyst Center webinar about the expanded child tax credit and its implications for families raising children and youth with special health care needs. Thank you so much for attending. At this time, I'd like to give a few bits of instruction and share a few messages. Uh, the webinar is being recorded and the recording will be posted following the webinar on the Catalyst Center's website and we'll be providing you with that information um, later on. Uh, during the webinar, we would like to ask that you please use the Q&A button to ask questions. You can ask questions at any time during the webinar and staff from the Catalyst Center will be reading the question and answers and we'll make every effort to answer as many as possible. For questions that we're not able to answer live during the webinar, we will be posting uh, questions and answers to our website along with the webinar recording sometime uh, following the webinar. Also following the webinar, um, we have a list of uh, resources related to the expanded child tax credit uh, that we will also be posting on our website in addition to the recording and the question, question and answer document. Uh, if you have any technical difficulties uh, during the webinar, please use the chat to let us know, or you can email uh, Rebecca Bilodeau, who is the program manager here at the Catalyst Center. The program schedule for our time today uh, is as follows. Uh, we'll do a quick welcome and introductions uh, to the Catalyst Center and our uh, esteemed panelists. Um, Elaine Mogg from the Tax Policy Center will start us off talking about the child tax credit, uh, both now and uh, looking into the future. Uh, Stacy Collins from the Association of Maternal Child Health Programs will uh, talk about the importance of the expanded child tax credit for maternal child health and for families raising SHIN. Uh, and then um, we have a wonderful uh, speaker from C the Colorado Department of Health and Environment, Isabel Dickerson, Dixon, excuse me, Isabel Dixon, uh, to share um, the activities that Colorado is engaged in to help connect families uh, to the financial support uh, that the expanded child tax credit offers and um, what they've been doing in their state. Finally, we hope to have um, a good amount of time for question and discussion. So without further ado, I will um, keep going. So for those of us, those of you uh, attending who don't know the Catalyst Center, the Catalyst Center is uh, funded by HRSA and the Maternal Child Health Bureau to be the National Technical Assistance Center for healthcare financing and coverage for children and youth with special health care needs. We uh, provide technical assistance, training, and support to state Title V programs, uh, specifically SHIN programs as well. Um, and we also um, partner very closely with family leader organizations like Family to Family Information Centers and uh, Family Voices at the national level and at the state level. Uh, we're here, we're funded to help you. So feel free to contact us anytime. And at this time, the Catalyst Center um, team is made up of myself, Allison Boffman. I'm the project director here at the Catalyst Center. Um, our senior project director and principal investigator of the grant is Meg Camo. And as I mentioned, our program manager is Rebecca Bilodeau. I'd love to introduce our presenters for today. Elaine Mag is Principal Research Associate in the Brookings, Urban Brookings Tax Policy Center at the Urban Institute, where she studies income support programs for low-income families and children. Before joining, joining Urban, Elaine worked at the Internal Revenue Service and the Government Accountability Office as a Presidential Management Fellow. She has advised congressional staff on the taxation of families with children, higher education incentives in the tax code, and work incentives in the tax code. And MOG co-directed the creation of the net income change calculator, which is a tool that allows users to understand the trade-offs between tax and transfer benefits and changes, changes in earnings or marital status. 
Stacy Collins is the Associate Director of Health Systems Transformation at the Association of Maternal Child Health Programs, or AMCHIP. She directs the association's health reform policy efforts, educating state members about the evolving health reform landscape and its implications for maternal and child health populations. She serves as core staff for federal and foundation funded technical assistance programs to strengthen the Title V workforce and promote new service delivery models that reflect current maternal child health priorities. Stacy has over two decades of experience in healthcare policy and programming related to women, children, and families, and she has worked in membership associations, advocacy organizations, and direct practice settings. Isabel Dixon is the Economic Mobility Specialist in the Maternal and Child Health Program at the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. Isabel works to identify and implement evidence-based strategies to improve economic mobility for Colorado families, including strategic community partnerships to increase enrollment in services that support economic well-being and improve health outcomes for Colorado families. Thanks to all of our panelists today for joining us and um, sharing such great information. Elaine, I will uh, hand it off to you. Thank you so much. I am um, really excited to be here today because I understand there's a lot of people who actually do the work of getting resources to families. Um, as someone who spends my time thinking about tax policy, I know no matter how much progress we make, it can never you know, actually amount to anything unless people actually get the benefits. And so I really appreciate what you all are doing. I wanted to take a little time today to describe what has happened with the child tax credit and some administrative changes to the credit, how we can help people get the credit, and then finally, um, what I see as the future of the credit. So on the first slide, what I've done is listed um, three changes to how we calculate the tax credit. And I'll frame this all by noting it's a temporary increase. It's just for 2021 right now. So we used to have a child tax credit that extended up to $2,000 of benefits. Um, per child in your house under age 17. For this one year only, if you have a child that is ages zero to five, you will qualify for a $3,600 credit and a child ages six to 17 will qualify for a credit of up to $3,000. So those 17 year olds are newly eligible. And then the most important thing that happened is the tax credit was made fully refundable and what we mean by this in the tax system is even very low income families will get the full value of the credit. It doesn't phase in as your earnings increase, which is typical. And so that means we have this um, new population to try to find and reach out to. So all low income citizen children should be eligible for the full value of the credit. And what it did is it built it built on an existing credit. So it's always been the case that the child tax credit covered almost all families with children. But in the old design, we had 27 million children who were in low income families who didn't get the full $2,000 of the credit simply because their parents didn't earn enough money. And as anyone who works in the world of poverty scholarship or in the real world understands, that's sort of the backwards way to subsidize families with children. So this next slide shows a picture of the child tax credit, just to sort of drive home what that full refundability means. The gray line on this chart shows what used to be the law and what will be the law if we don't extend the current rules. So it used to be if you had a very low income family, you received a very modest credit and that credit grew as your earnings grew. And then there's a long period where everyone receives the maximum credit and then it would phase out. In 2021, those blue and red bars represent um, older children and younger children. So you can see, even if your earnings are zero, you're getting the full value of the tax credit. It still does phase out. Now it does it in sort of a complicated way. It phases down to the old benefit levels then it's flat for a while and then it phases down again so that families with incomes over $200,000 if you're a single parent 
or over $400,000 if you're a married couple, begin to see their credits decline until it phases out completely. It's important to note that there's no maximum number of children. If you have three children who are all between the ages of six and 17, you'll qualify for $9,000 in child tax credits. The next credit sort of drives home, the, the next slide, sorry, um, drives home how important this full refundability is. So of all the changes made, increasing the size of the credit, adding older children to eligibility, it's making the credit fully refundable that matters for those low-income families. So at the Tax Policy Center, what we often do is we stack everyone in the United States up from the lowest income person to the highest income person. And then we chop that population into five equal sized groups. And that's what I'm showing on this chart. So the far left, this is if you're in that lowest income, 20% of families before the changes were made, on average, those families with children were getting a little over $1,000 in benefits. Under the new law, those families, those same lowest income families are receiving close to $4,500 on average. It's higher than $3,000 because many families have more than one child. You can see what that also does is it makes the benefits that low-income families get more on par with the benefits that higher income families get. So that's the most significant change. And so if you are someone who advocates for policy for low income families, if you have to choose between which expansion is most important to you, if you want dollars in pockets of low income families, it's keeping that credit fully refundable. The next slide describes, we also made some significant administrative changes to the child tax credit the year this year. So typically, the child tax credit is just part of your tax return. You file a tax return, you calculate how much tax you owe, you calculate how many credits you qualify for, and then if you are owed more credits than taxes owed, you receive a tax refund. And that's how low-income families would see their child tax credits. And that meant at tax time, low-income families would get a um, rather significant boost to their overall earnings. These are certainly can be very good things, but it meant that the tax credit really didn't have the power to smooth out income over the course of the year. So in 2021, half of the child tax credit can be received in advance of filing a tax return. Those monthly payments started back in July, but it's important to know the way the law was written. If you found someone that was eligible for payments that hadn't received a July or August payment in September, they'll just get more credit than they would have gotten if they'd been receiving it in July and August. So they're still gonna split up that 50% of the credit you qualify for over whatever portion of July to December, you're actually getting benefits. Um, the next slide is trying to think about um, these advanced payments. So the whole um, reason we have advanced payments is it's, a it's an attempt to better match timing to need. So there's research that shows that nearly 40% of low-income households with working age adults have household income that's either jumping up or dropping below their average in at least six months of the year. So the story is that most low-income people aren't low income because they're earning low wages all throughout the year. Their incomes are actually bouncing around. And we know from research but, um, that it's not only bad for children to be in um, a household that doesn't have enough resources in any given month. It's also bad that volatility in and of itself is a second way that children can be harmed when they're low income. So the child tax credit is um, in being advanced out throughout the year is trying to deal with that volatility so that there's some income coming into the household every month. The problem with advancing payments in the tax system is that we typically um, calculate how much tax you've paid, how much tax you owe, and resolve that at tax time. If we deliver tax credits before we actually know what you qualify for, there's a risk of an overpayment. And there's also, it's going to be more complex for people. But in 2021, low-income families have been protected from these overpayments. So the notion is that the IRS began sending out these payments without asking anyone, do you want them? 
They did it based on the best information they had. But for some families, that'll be what your family looked like in 2019 if you didn't file a 2020 tax return. And we know that families are dynamic. They're changing. Children are moving in and out of households. Couples are marrying. Marriages are dissolving. And all of these can affect your benefits. So for at least this one year, if you're a low-income family and the IRS advanced payments to you, you are not at risk of having to pay them back, um, which is an important thing to think about as we move forward with legislation, what sort of protections do we wanna offer? The next slide talks about this group that is least likely um, to be getting the um, payments and that's non-filers. So in the tax system, we call you a tax filer if you filed a tax return. And if you didn't file one, you become a non-filer. Doesn't mean you did anything wrong. Lots of low-income families aren't required to pay taxes. Their earnings just aren't high enough to have that obligation. But nonetheless, if we want to deliver a child tax credit, now we need to find you. So the CTC, the child tax credit, has always reached over 90% of families with children. And now what we're adding is these very low-income families with children. Um, parents uh, might not have been working, and you also might be a new parent. So you might have filed a tax return and had a baby or adopted a baby or be fostering a child, and all of those situations might make you eligible for the child tax credit. So we want to find you and get those payments going. So there's an opportunity to apply for the child tax credit on the IRS website. My warning, though, is that this website was not made um, mobile friendly, and we know that low-income families tend to access the internet through their phones. Um, so it's um, uh, it's sometimes advisable if there's someone with a, a, a desktop computer or laptop that they could help the person access the internet in a way that the IRS website is designed to operate on. There's also a group that has stepped in to fill this void. They're called Code for America. And their website is actually mobile friendly and it's called getctc.org. And so I encourage anyone who's trying to apply for the child tax credit on a mobile device to go to that link instead. It feeds information directly into the IRS website. It's merely providing an interface um, that is, um, you can access it on a, a mobile phone. There's also an opportunity in the IRS to, um, at the IRS website to update your information. So if your bank account has changed, you can tell the IRS where your credit should be going. If you are a family who would prefer not to receive the child tax credit in advance, you can also do that. And probably by next month, they'll have the option where you can actually go in and change your marital status or the number of children in your household that we can make sure the payments that are coming to you after this are correct. The next slide is sort of looking um, into how you can help non-filers. So there's a group that um, they're called Propel. They work largely with families who receive um, food stamps or SNAP benefits. And they tested a lot of messages with their clients to see what resonated and actually encouraged people to go ahead and sign up for the child tax credit. And they found that messages that did not um, use the words tax credit, which is not surprising to anyone, were actually more appealing. So the message that got the most people to click on the link was new cash benefit for kids. Did you get your July payment? So if I were delivering this message today, I might ask, did you get your August payment? Um, and that message was the one that resonated most with the families we're trying to find. Um, it's important to know that unlike normally at tax time, there's some obligation to have um, be a tax preparer or to sign a return if you help someone file it. For this particular activity on the IRS website, you do not need to be a tax preparer to help someone sign up for the credit. So a family friend is able to play that role, as would be a caseworker or you know anyone else that the um, person feels comfortable with. The other thing I want to mention is I think the reason we rely on these tax benefits, which can become quite complicated, are because they don't interact with other benefits people receive. So your Medicaid is not affected when you receive a tax refund, and it won't be affected by this child tax credit being delivered to you in advance. 
That's true of SNAP benefits and TANF benefits as well. And so families don't need to worry if they choose to take the child tax credit that they're gonna cut off you know, some other important form of assistance. Um, we've heard people say that they didn't apply for the credit because they receive disability benefits. And so it's normal when income comes into your house that you're at risk of losing these benefits. It's just not true in the tax system because of the way the law is written. So finally, in conclusion, this change has been incredibly important for um, low and middle income families, particularly if we're able to reach um, those very low income people who are most at risk of being left out. So in the budget resolution that's sort of advancing and fits and starts through Congress now, there is room for an extension of the child tax credit. It's um, completely unclear whether it would be a permanent um, extension of the rules that are happening in 2021. Um, it wouldn't surprise me to see something that was just um, four years of an extension because there's some other tax um, rules and laws that are changing that need to be dealt with. Um, so we don't know what, but it's worth um, trying to follow this and see what's happening. And the change that I will be advocating for when I speak with um, folks interested in delivering benefits to those very low income families will be to keep the um, credit fully refundable so that even without earnings, you can receive the maximum credit. And finally, the reason this child tax credit has been such big news in the low income tax community, I think there's one final slide, is that it's um, a quarter of the new benefits that are being delivered in this bill are going to low income families. And that's a, a really large amount when you think about the history of the child tax credit, which used to be really focused on middle income families. So it provides benefits for the lowest income families on par with those of middle income families, but to, to really drive it home, it's a temporary extension. So if your clients are receiving benefits now in a monthly paycheck or monthly benefit, um, that could end come January 1st if the law is not extended. Um, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you so much, Elaine. Um, I can already see some questions um, that people may have uh, for you to answer later on. But at this point, I want to keep things moving. And I'll invite uh, Stacy Collins from AMCHIP to, to give her remarks. Thank you, Allison. And um, thank you to the Catalyst Center for inviting me to participate on this really important and timely webinar. And I wanted to um, emphasize uh, to everyone on the call who works in the MCH field, who works with families of children with special health care needs, that if you walk away with anything today, it's a sense of urgency for how we need our entire community out there advocating and urging parents to enroll in this program. We know, and I'll, I'll, I'll be showing you some of the statistics on how the, the, the deep amount of research that's out there on how anti-poverty programs improve child health outcomes. So I'm really hoping you all take the charge. So um, as I said, there is lots of research out there to show that increasing family income improves MCH outcomes. Um, we know that the child tax credit can improve health outcomes related to income disparities. As Elaine just showed in her presentation. Um, we know that the child tax credit is effective for reducing infant mortality because of the link between infant mortality and higher poverty levels in our society. And we know that among families receiving the EITC, which is another tax credit that's been around for quite a long time, which is tied to adult employment, families getting the EITC um, show improvement in both maternal health and birth health outcomes. Next slide. There is evidence in the clinical community about the importance of tax credits. The National Academy of Medicine has produced research in this regard, as has uh, the Academy of Pediatrics. And these are two um, journals that you can uh, reference. I believe I have the links in the slides. Next slide, please. So I'm not sure how many of you might be aware of a group at the um, UT, University of Texas at Austin, called the Prenatal to Three Impact Center. They look at policies that directly impact uh, child well-being. And looking at best practices for states, there are five, five most effective practices that states can implement are all income related, as you might imagine. Um, one of them is the Medicaid expansion. 
it puts more money into families' pockets if they are not grappling with medical bills, <clears throat> price of premiums, uh, reducing the administrative burden for SNAP. SNAP is a federal program, but it uh, is administered at the state level. Implementing paid family leave, increasing the state minimum wage, and implementing the state the state earned income tax credit, which about 30 states have done finally, have done at this point, excuse me. Um, so all of these are important, but you know, special emphasis on number five, which is tax credits, critically important for improving child health. Next slide. I wanted to show you uh, one of the block grant applications. Everyone on, uh, on, involved in MCH on the call knows that each state submits an application um, annually to receive um, their federal portion of the Title V block grant. And this is um, an excerpt from California, which has an objective that specifically calls out addressing child poverty. And their activity within this objective is to increase um, access to and information about and enrollment in the Child Tax Credit Program as well as a host of other uh, safety net programs. But again, um, there is a real opportunity for states uh, to engage in this activity, especially those of us in the MCH program. Next slide, please. So why should we as MCH advocates and advocates for families of children with special health care needs get involved in this? Why does it have to, why does it absolutely need to be a priority for all of us? We are trusted messengers, or I should say more like you are trusted messengers in your states and communities. People listen to you, they trust what you have to say. You have very strong connections to communities. And for MCH people, you have very strong connections to your local grantees. This can be built into your expectations for your grantees. And I would encourage you to tap all of your constituencies with this information, um, with helping families enroll, with getting the information out about the child tax credits. And I'm including everybody that you might come in contact with, the family to family organizations, healthy start agencies, home visitor organizations of which there are plenty in every state, adolescent health coordinators. People often think that families with teens aren't aren't eligible for a lot of these programs. And as Elaine just said, this goes all the way up to age 17 and getting the information out to your school liaisons, also critically important. Okay, that's, that's my message. Thank you so much, uh, Catalyst Center for hosting me. Thank you so much, Stacey. Um, it's really been a pleasure to have you here. And um, just moving on, so we have a lot of time for um, questions and discussion. I want to invite Isabel Dixon from Colorado to share all of the incredible work and um, the, the priority setting that they're doing in the state around uh, reducing child poverty. Isabel? Thanks, Allison. So um, I'm going to share a little bit with you today about what we've been doing in Colorado to connect families to the expanded child tax credit. Next slide. I'm going to start out with a little bit about why we're in this space and why we care about promoting the child tax credit or the CTC. Um, promoting child tax credits and tax credits in general is one of four strategies in our economic mobility program. And part of the Colorado Maternal and Child Health Program's broader move upstream to address social determinants of health, because we know that these root cause determinants impact health outcomes across the life course and across generations. Um, we know that expanded child tax credits specifically are associated with few fewer ACEs, reduced infant mortality and child maltreatment, reduced trauma, better childhood nutrition, and better long-term educational outcomes and intergenerational health. So that's a little bit about our why. Um, now a little bit about our what we're doing in Colorado. Next slide, please. Um, for those of you who work in a Title V program, I wanted to say a few words about our process of integrating upstream strategies into our work. We started with a needs assessment using Colorado specific data along with community and public health staff input and identified four, that four of our seven priority areas would have a social determinants of health focus. Those four priorities are built environment, pro-social connection, reducing racial inequities, and economic mobility where our tax credit work sits. And of course, you don't have to have an economic mobility program to promote the CTC in your priority work, but we did find it beneficial to go through this process to carve out resources for this work. 
And then specific to Shin families and economics, we know that having a child with special health care needs has economic impact on families and that the demand on Shin families may require that parents cut down on their work hours, give up their job, and um, at the same time that they face significant out-of-pocket costs, health care costs that might not be uh, covered by insurance. Next slide, please. So our strategies this year have been focused on using our public health and community networks to get the word out so families can begin getting the child tax credit payments this past July and this month. We did feel a sense of urgency about this this spring and summer after the American Rescue Plan Act passed. Um, you can see some of our strategies here. Um, we are focused on outreach and messaging, training for existing navigators and new navigators, um, strengthening our VITA sites. Those are free tax help sites where folks can get tax filing assistance and then our partnerships. Um, I wanna prioritize that we're, I, I wanna focus on the non-filers piece. We talked about that a little bit earlier. Um, what do we know about non-filers in Colorado that they're generally low income, um, making less than $12,000 a year or $24,000 household. The, uh, they are a higher uh, proportion of immigrant and refugee populations, non-English speaking populations and rural populations. So a lot of eligible Coloradans are not claiming the earned income tax credit. We, we use that as a proxy to understand non-filers in general, um, the eligible for earned income tax credit versus claiming. And Colorado is actually tied for the third lowest earned income tax credit participation rate in the U.S. So we have a lot of room for improvement there. Um, and the, the non-filer piece, if people who don't file taxes because their income is too low to owe tax um, may feel, may have other barriers as well that we want to understand further. They might not be aware of the child tax credit because they're not engaged with the IRS. Um, they, they might uh, worry that it would affect or impact their other benefits or have other trust barriers. Um, and so since people who already file taxes would just automatically get this benefit and don't need to do anything, we're really focused on people who don't know about it and, and where they are. Next slide, please. So this year we created messaging toolkits and we began using our maternal, maternal and child health programs to get the word out. Here's an example of our messaging. Our spring messaging toolkit um, happened when the American Rescue Plan Act passed. And then we did another summer messaging toolkit to promote the non-filers portal when that was activated by the IRS. There are lots of great toolkits out there now that you can adapt. Um, you don't have to do it in-house and, and um, they, it's really easy. There's unbranded toolkits. Um, and I think we have some resources at the end to connect folks to those. We're looking forward to developing a full communications plan uh, focused on reaching our non-filers, especially through influencers and communities. And basically the overall idea is to drive traffic to filing next steps to meet various levels of support needed from do-it-yourself, folks who are perfectly happy with a link and can um, gather their documentation, documentation and complete the filing process on their own, um, all the way to full tax filing assistance through um, VITA tax sites, which are volunteer income tax assistance sites. And what we would like to do is support these VITA sites and strengthen them and expand them across the state so that there are um, good landing places for navigators. Next slide, please. We're also focused on co-enrollment. Uh, this means bundling tax outreach with other referrals such as SNAP, WIC, and child care subsidies. Home visitation um, is a good avenue for this. One of our local public health agency grantees has done outreach and messaging and training with their home visitor programs. We're connected with school-based health centers to present to staff and provide referral resources such as flyers. Um, a lot of states have unified benefits platforms. Ours is called Peak in Colorado, but this is like a one-stop shop where people can connect to benefits. And we want to partner with the agency that hosts that site to make sure there's um, a link and information there about the child tax credit. Um, United Way 211 is another important partner for us in making sure that they have the latest information and the resources they need to be able to answer questions and refer people um, to VITA tax sites. 
And then three of our local public health agency maternal and child health grantees will be integrating child tax credit outreach into their existing enrollment activities starting in October. Things like pop-up enrollment events that we're going to just be focused on WIC, SNAP, and child care subsidies. They will add a uh, tax referral or even filing if we have the resources to those events and um, mobile, enro mobile enrollment vans as well. Next slide, please. Uh, another important part of our approach is training for existing navigators and if and when we have the resources, new navigators. And so by navigators, I mean anyone who works with families to refer them to services or is a trusted voice in the community, from care coordinators for programs for children, youth with special health care needs, all the way through to um, grandparents and people who work close, closely with schools and are trusted in their communities. Care coordinators are critical in set various settings um, to getting the word out and to connecting families to these opportunities. So we want to raise awareness of the CTC and the power of the CTC among navigators and then support them with materials and training at whatever level they have capacity for. Most are overloaded. They already have a lot of information they're trying to um, give and receive with their clients and talking about taxes can be intimidating. You don't want to get it wrong. Um, so just making sure that there's adequate training and, um, and that they feel comfortable, as comfortable as possible. We are exploring placing navigators in pilot direct service sites for warm handoffs. And importantly, we want to learn from navigators and care coordinators. What is their comfort level in talking about taxes? Why do they think some families aren't filing? Um, our absolute main message to, when engaging with navigators and care coordinators is that you don't have to be a tax expert to talk about the child tax credit. There are other resources for that. Next slide, please. So our outreach really depends on our partnerships. We started with our internal state health department programs that we had ready access to, things like WIC, um, our child and adult care food program to reach child care centers, our, chill, our program for um, children and youth with special health care needs, we call it HCP, our Essentials for Childhood Grant and other programs. So these programs are using their existing channels, communication channels to champion the child tax credit through things like newsletters, emails with links to outreach toolkits and presenting at their grantee meetings. Um, partnering with other state agencies is uh, becoming increasingly more important. Um, the Department of Revenue in Colorado has been fabulous in providing us with uh, zip code specific tax filing data and helping us understand that data. And um, we're connected with programs through our Department of Human Services, including Head Start and Refugee Head Start. So we're excited about that. And we look forward to more interagency collaboration. Uh, I mentioned Mile High United Way, that's an important partner for us. A few other examples that happened this spring and summer um, through our local grantees. And, and our state our state team, we did a text campaign in partnership with Bright by Text that went out to 15,000 caregivers in English and Spanish. Uh, we partnered with the LEAP Energy Assistance Program and Hunger Free Colorado to send a mailer to thousands of Colorado households. And um, some of our grantees have just done great work with their um, community specific relationships um, in, on the ground. Next slide, please. Community partnerships, uh, I mentioned our LPHAs, we're starting with our 12 largest largest, and getting the word out and we will be expanding our messaging and training opportunities to all of our local public health agencies statewide. They have their unique uh, community partnerships to tap, but um, a few examples I love, Tri-County Health Department in, in the Denver area stapled 400 uh, flyers about the, the child tax credit to food boxes that went out to food pantries in the Denver area. They're working through their early childhood and wellness councils and other programs housed internally in their agency. Uh, agencies have some opportunities um, from COVID. Ex they've expanded their communications channels to get the word out about vaccines and COVID guidance and um, are looking at using those channels to get the word out about uh, the child tax credit. And then clinical settings are important. We have a physician champion who's presented to the Colorado AAP and highlighted the potential impact of the CTC in the newsletter as well. Uh, national partners, Code for America has been very important. They kindly created dedicated URLs for Colorado referrals so that we can track our progress. They also have amazing navigation resources. So things like decision trees, videos, um, just general basic information about the CTC so that navigators can feel confident in talking about the child tax credit at whatever level they have time to get into with their clients. 
And then the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, they have lovely adaptable toolkits that you can um, use at however you see fit and brand with your own agency's logo as part of their Get It Back campaign. And they've also been great in providing one-on-one -on -one consultation to our program um, to make sure that the messaging we're sending out is vetted and correct about taxes because we are not tax experts. Next slide, please. So just a couple things that we're doing um, to support Shin families specifically in connecting to the child tax credit. We collaborated with our fabulous state Shin team uh, to update the intake screens in their care coordination client management system uh, to add prompts to mention the CTC. We originally started by um, thinking about income levels and then, you know, as we all came to understand the child tax credit a little more, we realized basically everyone is eligible for this tax credit and it should just be mentioned to everybody, um, particularly if you think they might be low income or for any reason not connected to the tax system. We've provided information about the expanded child tax credit at our HCP statewide meetings to care coordinators and we've gathered information from care, coordina care coordinators about their barriers to talking about taxes. What is their comfort level in talking about taxes? What do they need to feel supported and confident? and having those conversations, and what do they think common barriers are for families uh, who are not claiming the tax credit. So we want to learn from navigators to improve our outreach. Next slide, please. So a little bit about what's next. Um, we're watching closely the federal legislation landscape with our fingers crossed. Um, we're preparing for the 2022 tax season in our messaging and in our plans with our partners. We're preparing for expanded training capacity if new funding arrives and planning our evaluation efforts and further, further gathering of info about barriers to tax filing for different groups so we can understand those groups better. And we're um, preparing to scale up as we get, begin to partner with other state agencies and across agency collaboration to promote the CTC. Um, opportunities for state and local agencies, just keeping an eye out for potential funding as we recover from the pandemic, there can be opportunities um, to help communities recover by doing expanded outreach and training to connect folks to tax credits, and then connecting with other agencies and programs, um, other state agencies and uh, programs and communities to get the word out to as many families as possible because programs know um, their clients and they have great ideas that we can learn from. So that's all I have and thanks a lot. Good to be here. Thank you so much, Isabel. Um, I wanna encourage folks at this point to um, use the Q&A um, box to um, type in any questions that you have for any of the panelists or ourselves. Um, Meg, I wanna invite you to, to share your comment if you'd like. Oh, sure, Allison, thank you. Um, it looks like as a co-host, I can't put into the Q&A, so I, I popped it into the chat. Um, I just wanted to suggest to folks that when you're talking with families, obviously the emphasis is on low-income families and that makes total and complete sense. Um, and, and I highly uh, support that, but I also just wanna remind uh, us all who work with families raising kids with special health care needs, Oftentimes there's financial squeeze regardless of income because of those three classic pathways to financial hardship that the Catalyst Center identified probably 15 years ago. There's higher medically and health related expenses. There's higher expenses for the kinds of things that every family spends money on like electricity and housing and transportation. And then there's reduced income. So it's, it's, it's a, a broader range perhaps of income categories that you would probably emphasize this kind of conversation with um, for families raising Shin. Thanks. Thanks, Meg. I really appreciate what you mentioned, Isabel, in terms of how you all started, um, you know, with the sort of figuring out who, which families you were going to try to communicate with about the child tax credit, expanded child tax credit, and then basically deciding, well, this should, this is just a universal thing that we, we want to tell everyone about. Um, re, and that makes it easy, right? Because you don't have to then try to screen, screen for, for need. Um, we have a couple of questions um, in the Q&A that um, are probably uh, for you, Elaine. Um, one, uh, one, 
person asks, um, would child demise create a situation where the household would have to pay back money at the end of the year? So I'm guessing if the child um, happened to die, I think that's what they're getting at. Um, that's an excellent question. I believe the answer is always no, even um, if the special rules aren't in place because the tax system has a rule that your child counts as your child for tax purposes if the child is with you for six months of the year or the majority of the time they were alive if um, a child dies. So I think there's no risk of that. In particular, there's no risk for these very low income families who are sort of extra protected this year with those um, overpayment provisions. Thank you very much. Um, another person um, has a specific example that, that I think you addressed, but I think it's definitely worth emphasizing. Uh, they work with a family that receives TANF and also um, SSDI, uh, Social Security Disability Benefits for one child. Um, so they don't, there is no earned income in this family. They're asking if they would have to repay any of the uh, child tax credit. And the answer is they won't have to repay, as strange as that sounds. So um, I'm more familiar with SSI rules than SSDI, but there's um, the earned income disregard does not come in play. The unearned income disregard does not come into play. And um, I will caution if someone was able to save up enough of those payments, they could bump up next to an asset test, but it won't be an income test that causes problems. So, you know, maybe if you have a couple years of child tax cream credit payments sitting in the bank, then you might see an asset test come into play, but not um, just from the income coming into the household. Thank you. So if you're sort of saving that money in the bank, then it, it might um, build, up, build up high enough, but not if you're actually um, spending that money on things your, your child and family need. Um, another question that we have says, I may have missed this, but after receiving the monthly payments, per child, is this taken out of the taxes filed next year? That's an excellent question because I did not cover it at all. So normally what you would do is calculate your child tax credit when you file your tax return in the spring of the following year. So in this case, um, spring of 2022, you'll still be doing that. Only the share of the child tax credit you've already gotten, you won't be getting that again at tax time. Because the income, the um, credit amounts increased, and because only half of it is being advanced this year, families will still be getting sizable child tax credits on their tax returns this year. Um, if the legislation going forward distributed the payments all 12 months and allowed you to get 100% of the benefit, then you would no longer be getting the benefit at tax time. You would only be getting an advance. Um, so that could create a situation where someone just says the refund is so much more valuable to me that I prefer not to have the monthly payments. And that's um, always, I think, always going to be part of the law. You can opt out of those payments. Thanks, Elaine. A follow-up question that I just thought of. Um, if when a family who's a non-filer is connected to the advanced monthly payments, um, are they all set for um, the 2021 tax year or do they still have to file in the spring to get that second half of the $3,600? So the legislation didn't address this fully. Um, we do know in order to get the second half of the payment, they'll have to file a tax return. What we don't know is if you received advance payments and then you don't file a tax return, Will the IRS assume those payments were made in error and try to go collect them back? Or will the IRS assume they were made properly and not um, attempt to collect them? So the advice that I've seen from tax lawyers is everyone who receives a child tax credit should file a tax return in 2021 to either indicate that it was a proper claim and to get the second half or to get whatever piece hasn't been claimed yet. So thank you for that. That really has implications for um, folks who are attending who work directly with families because 
if you are connecting a family with the expanded CTC right now, then that family needs to sort of close the loop and, and file a tax return in the spring. And for families that aren't used to doing that, that's going to be another, an, another um, sort of thing for, for us in the community to work on. Um, and I know you mentioned that, Isabel, in terms of the work that's happening in Colorado, gearing up for the tax prep season. Uh, we have a question, uh, a couple more questions. Uh, I want to just take a look at the time. Uh, so I think these will be our last two questions. Um, so um, I'm not sure who best can answer this, but um, there's a question about how this could be incorporated into pediatric practices. Um, so maybe Isabel, if you want to think, talk a little bit about how Colorado is thinking about doing that um, in terms of, you mentioned, you know, the, the pediatrician champion you have that's um, presented at AAP with the state AAP chapter. Um, and also there's a portion of the question about how, how we could measure that this information is being offered to families so that performance is tracked. Um, Stacy, I'll give this, open this one up to you as well. Yeah, our physician champion is Dr. St St Sandy Senmark, and she's fabulous. She just had a um, piece in Health Affairs about the child tax credit, and um, she, I wish she was here to answer this because I'm not a pediatrician, but I think she's thinking about uh, doctors mentioning this to their clients that they know uh, may have financial difficulty. Um, and then there are flyers. You can hang them right in the office with QR codes. Um, QR codes have become definitely more important since the pandemic. We've all gotten more comfortable using them um, and just being comfortable and knowing about it and knowing the impact it has on health outcomes. And I think that's what she's trying to elevate um, in the clinical setting is, mm -hmm. is for, for those who aren't up on the research for what this can do for families long term. They might kind of know it intuitively, but not the actual um, impact on things like infant mortality. And I would just um, say that in response to the second question about measurement, um, for all the Title V people on this call, this, is, this would make an excellent state performance measure. Um, I know everyone is probably close to completing their applications for this coming fiscal year, because the applications are due next week, I believe. But thinking about this going forward, um, states can have as many SPMs as they want, um, and they can get as creative as they want. So please consider that for your next application. I think this would be great. And Isabel, I don't know if Colorado includes the CTC program. Um, I mean, it looks like it's part of your broader um, social determinants of health efforts. Um, but is, is this something that would make sense as an SPM, in your opinion? We included the percentage of households that spend more than 30% on housing as kind of our economic measure because ec our economic mobility priority has other strategies as well, including mm -hmm. championing paid family leave and um, co-enrollment for other, other benefits as well. Um, but yeah, I think it could be a great measure or a process measure. Um, and then just for tracking the hits to the website that we're driving to, Code for America, uh, this is what they do and love is... Um, is helping connect people to government services and making it easier. And um, they understand our, our desire to have metrics around whether we're making an impact. And so we're hoping that as more state agencies use that Colorado specific link, we'll be able to see how it's going. Thank you so much. Um, for, I think the final question um, I'll ask is, um, what happens if a child who is 17 turns 18 this year? In the tax world, we care about your age on December 31st, or the last day you're alive. And so that child is not eligible. If an errant payment was made to you and you're low income, it's no problem. If you're middle or high income, you're probably going to be asked to pay that back. Thank you, Elaine. Okay. Uh, oops. Sorry. I just want to go back to the slides. Um, thank you very much um, to all of our panelists. Again, um, thank you to, to all of you for attending. Um, I just want to reiterate that we will be posting um, a 
recording of the webinar uh, so that you can uh, watch it again, um, promote it um, to folks who you think might be interested in it. Um, a lot of resources that Isabel mentioned, um, there are even um, more um, that we have collected um, over the past um, couple of months. Um, so we will, we do have a list of resources that are, it's going to be posted on our website and um, I believe also emailed to everyone who's attended um, to attended today. Um, we would um, love to ask you um, to complete an evaluation of this webinar uh, so that we can better understand your needs and continue to produce helpful and quality resources here at the Catalyst Center. Again, um, you know, our focus and our funding um, is about providing technical assistance, training and support um, around um, healthcare financing and coverage. Um, and by extension, um, family financial hardship, um, as Meg so um, eloquently spoke about. Uh, thank you all for joining the webinar. Um, if you don't um, get a chance to complete the evaluation now, you will receive a reminder to complete it. Um, you can visit our um, website as well. Oh, whoops. Uh, visit us um, at catalystctr.org. Uh, email us anytime. Uh, you can also um, email me directly if you have any questions, um, TA needs, if there's anything we can do to provide you with support um, and access um, our resources, um, whether they're related to the CTC or, or other um, financing and coverage related resources. Thanks again to our panelists for their wonderful information and contribution. And thanks to all of you to, for attending. Um, have a great day.